Tyre stood in front of the four friends and the many witnesses who made it through the Deadland Deserts. And while surviving archaic beasts was certainly an achievement, even an Argivian titan would pale in power compared to the might of the man-eaters. An Argivian god would struggle to pull off even one of the many miracles of the Aesir, and the Vanir would easily overwhelm the nymphs and the spirits of the Argivian wilds. And Tyre might have been biased, but he loved the name Allfather more than God King. Although, Tyre would not be where he was today if he correctly estimated threats around him. He had seen how even his most powerful and famous brother could have his pride bruise far easier than his flesh. And Tyre had seen how someone considered harmless could kill even the proudest man. And Tyre knew the importance of sacrifice. The more important the task, the greater the sacrifice. And already in the crowd, Tyre could see someone who desperately needed his story. It was the way he carried himself. An arrogant teenage boy, pride and power in every step. One arm wrapped around his date, a young girl who was distraught and her thoughts a million miles away. Yet, despite the young man's arm wrapped around her, his other arm gripped a satchel he kept by his side. His grip is more gentle and tighter around his satchel than around the girl he was supposed to be here with. It reminded Tyre of how his brother, Thor, would drink, laugh, and feast with a woman in one arm, usually his wife, but not always, and his hammer in the other arm, a hammer with a broken handle, and one that Thor clearly loved more than his own wife or his children. This boy gripped his satchel the exact same way Thor gripped his hammer. Clearly, the boy's satchel was both his greatest strength and his greatest weakness, even if he didn't see it that way, yet. So when Tyre stood in front of everyone, he made con eye contact with several people in the crowd as he spoke, but he made certain that his eyes met this boy's several times. He knew in his heart that despite his best efforts, this boy would not follow Tyre's path willingly. That did not mean, however, that he wasn't walking down Tyre's path. A monster began as most monsters do, as a small bundle held by a parent. Two proud parents held three bundles between them. The immortal silver-tongued trickster Loki and the harm-bidding witch giant Ingerboda had three children between the two of them. The first child born they thought was a stillbirth, the little girl who was first born had skin that was blue as death, whose bones could be seen through her skin, with nails longer than her fingers and toes, and her dark hair already down to her waist, with no screen to declare herself to the world. As Loki and Anger Boda mourned their lost child together, Hel took her first breath and some life returned to her skin. Half of her body was the color of life, and the other half a, a blue so pale that her bones were visible under her skin. A sign that hell would live a life forever defined by death. She would only ever be warm where there was snowstorms. She would only eat hunger. She would only ever feast with famine. She would only ever rest on sick beds, and she would be queen to those that had no kingdom. In that moment, neither of Hell's parents were thinking of her future. They were only thankful that she had taken her first breath, and even if she was half dead, she was entirely their child. The second child born was a large snake that slithered out of his mother and into his father's arms, a snake so large that even as his head rest against Loki's breast, his tail was still being pushed out of anger Boda. The supernatural serpent Jorgaminder ate his own placenta as it was pushed out, and young Hel had to be kept separate from her hungry, growing brother. It did not take long for Jorgaminder 
to grab onto his own tail in his own mouth as he coiled around his own body. His hunger sated as he swallowed his own tail like the Ouroboros, a prophetic sign of Jormungandr's eventual fate. Jormungandr's growth grows so great that Odin would consider the young serpent a threat, and he would throw his nephew into the sea, where he would grow so large that he would circle the planet and still chew on his own tail, until one day that he would rise from the ocean killing the world, but he would also be killed by his cousin, Thor, in a fight that would also kill the god of oak trees. At that moment, Loki and Inger Boda were not thinking of prophecies. They were only thinking about how to get their child to stop eating his own tail, and how to keep Hel safe from her brother, and how to get a blanket long enough to keep Jormungandr warm. The final child of both Angerboda and Loki would be a young wolf pup. And while most wolf pups are born in litters, Fenrir was born alone. When Fenrir was born, he was born blind and deaf. The only love he would know would be through touch, smell, and taste. And after Fenrir's birth, the Aesir learned of Loki's children, who were taken from Angerboda and Loki. Fenrir would never know what his parents looked like, nor what they sounded like. The only love he would ever know from them was the warmth and touch that was soon taken from him. Before, he was judged by those he could neither see nor hear. And in time, as his sight and hearing developed, his fate, along with the fate of his siblings, were decided. Hell was asked if she was living or dead, and she would say that she was Hell, neither living nor dead. The Aesir found her terrifying to look at, and they gave her an important responsibility, far away from them. Where she would rule over Helheim, where she would be required to take all of the dead that neither the Aesir nor Vanir wanted in their realms. She would be given many servants and many gifts in the hidden halls. Her plates would be hunger, her knives would be famine, her cats would be Schrodinger, her wealth would be poverty, her warriors would be deserters, her heroes would be cowards, her advisors would be idiots, her songs would be silence, her beds would be sick beds, her threshold would be stumbling block, her seer would be blindness, her prophets would be madness, her wine would be poison, her kiss would be death rattle, her hearth would be snowstorms, and her angels would be madmen. And Hell smiled when she was told all that she would have in her halls. Perhaps the only one of Loki's children to live a happy life, and only because she lived life through death. To Jormungandr, the Norns would see that the Great Serpent would someday kill the world when he, was, when he finally let go of his tail. His venom would poison all of the seas of the world, and it would also be the beginning of Ragnarok, where Jormungandr would fight Thor, and even though Thor would kill his cousin, Thor would only survive nine more steps after the fight from how powerful Jormungandr's poison was. So they advised Odin the only way to delay such a fate was to keep the serpent as far away as they could from the god of thunder. So Odin threw the serpent into the oceans where Jormungandr would live a peaceful life, or peaceful except when Thor tried to fight or lift the world serpent. And Fenrir's fate would be the hardest to decide. The Norns warned Odin that Fenrir would someday kill Odin in battle, and unlike Hel, Fenrir would not be satisfied with his own kingdom, and unlike Jormungandr, Fenrir was not content to sleep and rest. Even before the pup could see or hear, the wolf would explore with his nose and his teeth, and every playful bite and nip scared all of the Aesir. All of the Aesir, except one. 
Being a god of justice, courage, and war does have a few advantages. So while the gods consulted with the wisest sources they knew on how to keep Fenrir from attacking Odin, I alone raised the pup like he was my own. I was there when he first opened his eyes. I was there with him when we hunted our first golden tusked boar together. I was there when he spoke his first words. I was there when Fenrir had his first nightmare. Nightmares of war, pain, chains, and of a man with one eye drawing his sword against Fenrir. Had to hold the poor pup close and reassure him while he whimpered. The man with one eye would never hurt him. I still don't know what hurts worse, lying to my father or lying to my son. But as I raised Fenrir, he grew stronger and stronger each day, and the Aesir grew more and more terrified as they tried to figure out how to contain him. First, they tried to contain him with a rope named Leiding, a rope strong enough to stop even Fenrir's half-brother, Odin's steed, Slepnir, a horse so fast and strong that he could travel from Asgard to Hell and return. The gods had me reassure Fenrir that it was just a test of his strength, that he wouldn't suffer in the ropes for long. So I pet my son on his snout while the Aesir wrapped the rope around him, and when they were done, I asked Fenrir to try and break out of the rope. Within seconds, Fenrir was free. The gods were terrified, and Fenrir was relieved to be free. So, I continued to distract and spend time with Fenrir as he grew larger and stronger each day. Some days, he would even chase the sun and moon across the sky, and I would have to keep Fenrir from biting into them while the Aesir tried a stronger chain to try and keep Fenrir contained. So the gods asked for another challenge, a chance to try and bind Fenrir again. While Fenrir worried, I assured him that if he broke out of the chains, that his strength would be legendary. And while Fenrir did worry, I knew, even then, that Fenrir had his pride. When we hunted, he would push himself further and further until he proved himself a better hunter than me. When we went fishing with Ran, he would keep diving into the water until he could prove he was better than her nets. When he met with Thor, Fenrir would drink kegs upon kegs of ale until he could outdrink even Thor. So, the Aesir brought forth a powerfully titanic chain named Dromi, which was brought to Fenrir with the hope that it may contain Fenrir. Dromi was once used to drag an entire mountain behind the greatest of all ships, the Skidbladnir. Even with all the gods working together, they struggled to move the chains as I again comforted Fenrir while they hammered the chains into rock below, and he was once again carefully wrapped up in these chains while I gently scratched Fenrir's chin while we waited for the loud hammering to stop. When it finished, Fenrir was once again asked to try and break out of the chain, and it took Fenrir even less time to break out of this chain than it did for the rope. Not because the chain was weaker, but because Fenrir was stronger. Fenrir, now confident in his strength, bragged to all of the gods that no substance that existed in the Nine Realms was strong enough to contain him. And unfortunately for Fenrir, he sealed his own doom with his own words. Odin once again asked me to watch Fenrir, but he told me that this time it would not be nearly as long to try and bind Fenrir. And while Odin worked with the Aesir, I spent more time with Fenrir as his pride and power both grew. He would swim to the bottom of the ocean to prove that he could reach the palaces of the deep. He would hike up the highest mountains to prove that the cold did not bother him. And he even walked through the fires of Muselheim to prove that the flames were not strong enough to scorch his fur. And stronger still, 
Fenrir grew day by day. And I knew that Fenrir's pride would someday mean that he would seek to fight Odin. Even knowing that, it was painful to me what happened next. Odin had me bring Fenrir to an island of Heather, a sacred place to Asir and Vanir alike. Now the object brought forth was neither a rope nor a chain. However, it was a ribbon. One as soft and smooth as silk and as beautiful as the stars. The ribbon, named Glipnir, was shown to Fenrir. The gods showed that they could not tear the ribbon, despite its soft appearance. They asked Fenrir if they could try to bind him again. And if Fenrir could break out, then that would be proof that Fenrir was stronger than even Odin, who too showed that he could not tear Glipnir. Fenrir, however, was hesitant. Fen he knew he was strong, and Glipnir was just a ribbon. Something that could be torn by a seamstress. Something used by a weaver to finish a dress, or a sail. Fenrir was the greatest of the wolves, already at a young age. He had many children, including Hel's newest hound, and young wolves that would someday eat both the sun and the moon. What challenge would Fenrir get in a ribbon? Unless it was a trick. An illusion and the seemingly weak ribbon was actually something that Fenrir could not break out of. Fenrir's pride was strong, but so was his apprehension. He knew that he was taken away from his parents by the Aesir before him, and even with all of his adventures across the Nine Realms, he still found neither his father nor mother. So where pride met apprehension, caution was born. Fenrir turned to the gods and he said, Instead of trusting my courage, I need something else to trust you. If I am not able to free myself from Glepnir, then I ask you to release me. He asked while the gods assured him. Buttering agreement, but Fenrir was not finished. And as an act of courage and trust, I ask for one of you to keep your hand in my mouth. So if you refuse to release me, I will refuse to release your hand, Fenrir said, and the Aesir went silent. Suddenly, the gods who just a moment ago were promising him that he would be released were now all as silent as Draugen in a graveyard. Are the Aesir liars or just cowards? Fenrir asked as he turned to face Odin, and for the first time, Fenrir made eye contact with the one-eyed god. Are you brave enough for your throne, or are you just a king of lies, Greybeard? Fenrir said, insulting Odin, who took a step towards the wolf, his grip on his sword. But he was interrupted by myself, stepping between them, placing my right hand between Fenrir's jaws, silencing the wolf, and with no fear in my eyes, I looked my adopted son in the eyes. Fenrir, we do not deceive you. Let us test your strength on the great Glepnir. If you escape it, then you will not be the only one who knows that you're stronger than the gods. If you cannot escape it, then we will release you. And if we lie to you, then it will be my hand you take. I told him as I looked him in his eyes, and for a moment I saw the pup I raised. But then it too was swallowed by pride as he nodded gently, and the gods wrapped Glepnir around the wolf, carefully tying his legs down to the rock below. I heard a few quiet whimpers from Fenrir as I hummed to him, gently stroking him with his left hand and his head rested on my lap, my right hand in his mouth, the ribbon being so much lighter than anything else that the gods soon declared the process done, and once again it was time for Fenrir to prove his strength. He flexed his leg, but the ribbon grew tighter around him. He struggled against the ribbon, and the more he struggled, the stronger Glepnir grew. The gods finally found something that wasn't just powerful enough to contain Fenrir. It was something that, just like Fenrir, would grow stronger than him. 
Fenrir said no substance that existed in the Nine Realms could contain him, so instead the gods gathered substances that did not exist. The breath of a fish kept the ribbon soft. The roots of the mountains would let the ribbon grow along with Fenrir. The sound of a cat's stomp would tighten the ribbons with every movement. The spit of birds would keep his skin soft. The beards of women would make up the threads. And a coward's courage would keep the ribbon strong. When Fenrir realized he couldn't release himself, for a moment I saw his eyes turn to me, hoping that I would ask the others to release him. And I wanted to turn to my brethren and ask them to release my son. But if I helped my son, I would be betraying my father. Even as the Aesir began to cheer and celebrate finally containing Fenrir, I kept petting him on my lap, even when realization was visible in his eyes. He finally realized that the gods were not going to release him. They would keep him confined until he either grew too strong to be contained, or someone released him. Still, I kept my right hand in his mouth while my left hand kept petting his head and neck, careful to comfort him, even in those final movements. Even when the others yelled at me to rip my hand out of Fenrir's mouth before he snapped it off, I kept my right hand in his mouth. His jaws were the only part of his body he could still move, and Fenrir still did not bite off my hand. I could only imagine the battle in his heart and soul while bound there. He could not bring vengeance on those who bound him there. He could not release himself, and the only person he could hurt was me, the one who raised him while the world hated or ignored him. In his eyes, I could imagine Fenrir begging me to listen to my family, begging me to take the choice away from him. If I removed my hand, then he did not have to keep his word. He would still be bound, but someone he loved could be unhurt. If I just removed my hand, then he could keep himself honest, and I would be unharmed. All I had to do was remove my hand, and he could hate me like he hated everyone else. But he couldn't hate me. Not with my hand in his mouth, not with me stroking his fur, not with his head in my lap, not with me having raised him. I wouldn't be a god of justice if I took my hand away. Justice wasn't slaying monsters, imprisoning criminals, and protecting golden hordes. Justice was knowing when you've done wrong and accepting your penance and punishment alike. Justice was knowing that sometimes there was no decision that left anyone happy, and accepting it because it was the most fair choice you could make. Justice was accepting consequences, even if you did everything correctly. You can raise a child to be the best they can be, and still watch their own pride and apprehension make them into someone you never raised them to be. You can protect your family by cutting off another member of your family. It did not make the choice any less painful. And even knowing it was the best choice did not make it a right choice. It was painful to make this decision, and I knew that if I withdrew my hand against my oath, I would not be a god of honor. I am not Loki. I take no pride in deception. I am not Odin. I take no pride in power. I am Tyre. I take pride in my honor. And even as the Aesir tried to pull my arm out of Fenrir's mouth, my hand remained still as my eyes darted away from Fenrir, and I made eye contact with Odin, my father, the only god to remain silent, the only one refusing to ask me to remove my hand. Odin's single eye was full of the same feelings I felt while I pet Fenrir, waiting for him to take my hand. Fenrir, with tears in his eyes, finally closed his eyes as he made his choice. Fenrir may not be my biological son, but he understood pride. He understood oaths, and he understood honor. 
He knew how much it hurt me to let him go like this, and he knew that he had to keep his word. Fenrir's jaws closed around my hand, severing it from the wrist as my blood fell to the heather below. And even as I lost blood, I kept petting Fenrir with my remaining hand, hoping for just a few more seconds with him before I was taken away forever. When I was pulled away from Fenrir, his eyes remained closed, and I never saw him again. It was too painful to visit him again, easier to see the monster he would be than the son he was or the poor beast he is. Kyer stopped his story for a moment as he showed his stump on his right arm, covered with metal, but he had no functional prosthetic, as he explained. Was there magic that could heal my hand? Yes. Is there enchanted armor that could act as a hand? Yes. So why am I still like this? A reminder, even a god of justice can do something wrong, even if it's for the right reasons. Even justice has to pay penance for wrongdoing. And around the Heather Island that Fenrir is on, more and more great monsters arrived and lived around him. Some are trying to free him, others to challenge him, and others still just to have a place to live. And now these leviathans live among each other, and they guard the only gate deeper into the pumpkin house. All of them are as great as Fenrir, or even greater still. Are you brave enough to battle the Leviathan, who is so powerful that only one who becomes who they choose to be is strong enough to slay it? Are you mighty enough to overpower Sobek, who is so large that his sweat creates the rivers of the world? Maybe you will take on the man-eaters, who will host you to lavish parties, where they ask you to li drink oceans and lift worlds? Or are you smarter than that? Will you take on the rattling skeletons who stand taller than towers and who are as indestructible and as invisible as death? Maybe you will instead take on Tinoch, a hungry giant who built a floating city on a lake who led his people for 200 years. Or there's always Fafnir, a dragon who was once a man, but his greed and gold grew so great that his body was twisted into a beast nearly as fearsome as his soul. There are many paths in the Leviathan lands and many ways to go forward, but they all lead through a dangerous creature's territory. You may rest in Hell's Halls. But ask yourself if you truly want to continue. Are you stronger than a Leviathan? Are you tougher than a Gasha Dokuru? Are you cleverer than a man-eater? Are you greedier than a dragon? Or are you someone else who can overcome these challenges in a different way? Are you someone who can shape destiny better than one who chooses what they will be? Are you someone who is holier than a priest? Are you someone even more courageous than thunder? Are you someone who is even more patient than Siegfried? Or are you someone else entirely? Maybe you will find a new way forward. But I warn you, all of these beasts exist not merely as challenges to overcome, but also as a reminder that even the best of you are fallible and fragile. These are not monsters that creep in closets and who sneak in shadows. They are natural disasters. They are god killers. They are inevitability, they are weakness, they are nature, and they are power. Remember how difficult it was for an entire pantheon to merely contain Fenrir? And even then, he will get out someday. Even with my sacrifice, even with a ribbon of paradoxes and non-existent substances, he will grow even greater than his prison and he will take down even the greatest of the Aesir in his final battle. Remember this when you face the beasts of the Leviathan lands. Are you truly greater than the ribbon wrapped around you? Or are you about to be trapped? Are you Fenrir, Lipnir, or Tyre? 
he asked once again, lifting his severed stump above his head to make his point very clear.